Hello, I'm Reverend Kathleen Haynes. I am the minister of Mount Olive and Relief United Methodist Churches up in the beautiful northwestern mountains of Virginia. I'm so glad that you could worship with us at this time and let us join together now in our call to worship. In the days of Noah, God placed a rainbow in the sky as the sign of a covenant of God's love for all the earth. In the colors of the rainbow, we see God's grace for all creation. In the days of Moses, the words of God were written on tablets of stone as a sign of a covenant between God and all God's people. In the tablets of stone, we see the sign of God's hope for each to live in peace with God and neighbor. In the days of the prophet, God promised to place a new covenant in our hearts. As members of the living body of Christ, we see the sign of God's promise among us. Our scripture reading today is Matthew 5, 13 through 16, and chapter 6, 1 through 8. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, first I want to start off with defining the word piety. The word that they use for piety in our translations is most closely related to the Hebrew word righteousness. Anybody like that word? Righteousness? Yeah. It's not one we use a whole lot. Of course, we don't use the word piety a whole lot as well, but to be pious, we think of it kind of, I don't know about y'all, but before I really learned that definition that it means righteousness, I kind of thought of it as being like, like a, a good, submissive person to God, right? Well, that's not wrong, but what it means to be a good, submissive person to God is to be someone who values justice, who values peace, who values all the things that Jesus talked about in the blessed R's. And so, to be pious means to try and live your life as a righteous person. Somebody who is staying away from evil and wrong, who is doing all the good they can, and staying in love with God. That sounds very Methodist, doesn't it? John Wesley was all about it. <laughs> And when we hear about the salt and light that Jesus talks about, um, how many of you know that you cannot live without a certain amount of salt in your diet? Did you? Okay. Uh, I had a neighbor one time when I lived out in rural Georgia, Miss Linnell. She was a Georgia peach, and she was so sweet. Um, I'm not making fun of her. That's literally how she talked. I thought I'd move back into the antebellum south when I moved down there from New York. But she was truly one of the most gentle and kind and just Christian people I'd ever met. She was wonderful. And she took direction very well, let's put it that way. And uh, she, she was told by her doctor to cut back on sodium. I didn't even know this was possible. I went to check on her one day because I hadn't seen her car for two days. 
and uh, she wasn't home. And I called around. Turns out she was in the hospital. She had cut out so much sodium from her diet that she ended up in the hospital with her electrolytes imbalanced. So I learned a long time ago, you know, a little salt of tea. <laughs> but um, for most of us as Christians, what does it mean to be salt? Because Jesus, he uses, the term he uses when he says you is a plural term. You are the salt of the earth. Well, salt, anybody invested in salt in the stock market lately? <laughs> anybody leading the market on salt shares? <laughs> and yet, salt is valuable. It is necessary. And in Jesus' day, it was even more so in terms of all the ways that it was used for preserving food and other things and um, for the fact that it could flavor food. They didn't have a whole lot, most of them, of options when it came to that. And so it was an essential element, and it still is today. And yet, Jesus says, but don't be too salty. So obviously he is talking about us as people of faith, right? But the thing is about being salt is that that means that we are of the world, we are a part of it, and we are a very necessary, integral part of being Christians in the world. Because Jesus was talking to his disciples. He was saying, you who are creating with me a new family, a new understanding, a new way of doing these things that go beyond just the law, we are going to this place of grace and of challenge and of trust. And as we all eventually came to understand as Christians, of even my death and resurrection, so sacrifice. And so we who understand these things and are part of the world, we need to be present in the world. We need to make sure that our presence as Christians is known to people, not in such a way that we're bitter in the mouth. You know, have you ever bitten into salt? Uh, I had the joy of floating in the Dead Sea once, and somebody lifted a hand, and it accidentally, one tiny drop, landed here on my mouth, on just below my lip. And I accidentally, without thinking about it, kind of rubbed my lips together. My whole mouth just sort of went <laughs> I've never tasted anything so salty in my life. Jesus says, don't force it in people's faces. Don't be an obnoxious Christian. But it is essential to let people know the reason I am the way I am, and hopefully the way you are is righteous, is because of God, because of my Savior. Okay? That makes sense? All right, let's move on to light. Um, light is a little different because light is not exactly inherent in the world. You don't dig and find light, right? We receive light from outside of us, from the sun. You can create light. Our candles were lit. Those were not lit before. And we had to ignite them. There had to be a spark to create that light. It is something that is brought into the world. And Jesus says, you all, again, that plural you, are to be the light in the world. Now, when you are in a dark room and you light a candle, is it just that one little column of light and everything else is still dark? No, it spreads out around the candle, right? And it just keeps going and going until it does eventually fade out. But there is a space all around the candle, above and below and extending out on every side. And Jesus says, be like that. Be someone who creates safe space. Have you ever thought about being a Christian as being a safe space? Good, some of you have, some of you haven't. We are called to be points of light that spread out and extend from us, all of us. And the more of us that do this, the more of us, the greater the light of the kingdom of heaven on earth grows. If you allow God through you, the glory of God expands out from you. 
and people began to understand that you were someone that they could go to. And it doesn't mean they're going to spill out their confession to you. Not necessarily. It may just mean that they know you are the type of person who will not judge them, who is safe to be around, who is comfortable and kind, who maybe is a source of strength when they are struggling. And they may never tell you that they're needing that or, or drawing on that from you, and yet you are able to give it to them because it is Christ through you as the light in the world. Do you see what I'm saying? I had a woman at one of my churches, the second Sunday I was there, barely, you know, just starting to get to know people, and uh, she had an issue that was about a decade old in her life that she had never spoken to another soul about. And as she was sitting there in the pew, she told me this later, she said, God said to her, you can talk to her, meaning me, her pastor. And she did. She came to me. And she said, I just heard God tell me this, and I knew that I could finally talk about it with somebody, and it would be safe. God will bring people into your lives who need a friend, who need perhaps just an acquaintance, but someone who helps them just by being you. So you use that value you already have as salt. The fact that you are a Christian and you allow it to share out through you, not just flavoring the environment around you with goodness, but, but literally allowing people to be drawn to it. And God says that is the kingdom of heaven on earth when others can experience Christ or Christ's love through your presence as well. The next section in Dr. Levine's book that I'm using is be perfect. And then she writes, don't panic. <laughs> Anybody else here be perfect and get a little panicky? No perfectionists in here? <laughs> Uh, I'm one of those odd perfectionists. I'm only perfectionistic about certain things. Other things I just don't even look at. Because <laughs> I'm like, uh, that will never be fixed. It will never be perfect. Our kitchen sink will never be empty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but here, the verb, be perfect, is a future tense. In other words, be perfect as my father is perfect. Do these things and you will be perfect. Okay? So it's not saying be perfect now. It's saying the more you are like God, the more the likelihood that you will reflect God and be like God. Don't try and be God. Don't try and be per perfect yourself because no one can do that in this earthly life. Only God. But try and be like God in the image of God. It's Less of a command and more of a statement. If you do this, then this is possible. That verb and all of that, the perfect part, if we translate it from the Hebrew again, it's much more close to a different term than perfect. It's much more closely related to the term complete. Anybody else like that one better? If you are like God, if you try and do these things in the way that God does them, and the specific example is, if you love your enemy, I don't know about y'all, but that's probably one of the hardest ones, right? Because it's not just loving your enemy and praying for them and thinking, okay, I pray he didn't die today, check. You know? <laughs> it is recognizing that your enemy is a fellow child of God, created in the image of God, just like you are. Oh, it makes it harder, doesn't it? First of all, it makes it harder to hate them. But second of all, it's hard to allow ourselves to think of them that way, right? Spend just a moment picturing your enemy, <laughs> if you have one. A lot, of, a lot of Christians don't want to ever admit we have one. 
But um, if something popped into your mind, that's eh, probably an enemy, <laughs> or at least the way you think about them. Enemies, especially for a lot of Christians, can be groups of people. It could be people of other faiths or other political views or um, certain groups that are trying to do certain things. I'm pretty mad at the folks that lobbied for uh, gambling in Virginia. <laughs> anyway, but picture them now as an infant, a newborn, hours old, wrapped in that sort of universal white blanket with the pink and blue stripe on it and the little beanie on their head. Don't picture the parents. Just picture that little infant on a soft mattress bundled up. Is that baby your enemy? Or is it a baby? That child is just like we were when we were born and swaddled. There is no difference there in how we were created and who created us. And therefore, when we say that that particular person or group of people or, or that range of ideas and the people who ascribe to it, that they are my enemy, we are saying, God, some of who you created are wrong. They're bad. They shouldn't have been. And that hurts God's heart. So therefore, we have to love our enemies. And that usually means trying to put ourselves in their mindset. We don't have to agree with them. But have you ever asked yourself, how did they get to that point? Why do they believe what they believe? How do they, why do they act the way they act? Why do they have their yard look the way it does on our street that looks so nice otherwise? Jesus says, if you can love them, the way God loves them, or if you are trying to love them the way God loves them, you will be more complete. Hate is sin. Sin separates us from God. If completeness is being at one with God, we have to love our enemy to be complete in God. We're supposed to be more righteous than the Pharisees. Those Pharisees. I think I told y'all last week I had to catch myself because I had begun kind of thinking then, not like an enemy, but like a group, a, a, a singular group. And they were sort of the bad guys in this story in my brain. And uh, that's been broken down now. I, I've remembered they're all individuals and they were all trying to do the best they could. And Dr. Levine quotes a historian from Jesus's, a little later after Jesus's day, but he's one of the primary Christian historians and Jewish historians of that time where we receive a lot of our material about the, about the practices. His name is Josephus, and he was not a fan of the Pharisees. Pharisees, if you'll remember, were kind of middle class. They were uh, the, the local scholars. They would study, and they would learn, and they would try and figure things out. And to be perfectly honest, it's, it's kind of like a lot of us today. Today, we would be equivalent as Christians to the Pharisees in terms of sort of the, the groupings of folks. And what Jesus is saying is, be better than the Pharisees. All right? And this is what Josephus says about the Pharisees, knowing that he's not a fan of them. He says that they actually were trying their best. He says they did live simply. They weren't after riches. They were really trying to be good Jews. They followed the conduct of reason. In other words, they took all those 613 laws and the Ten Commandments, and they tried to live them out in such a way that it was livable and that it stayed true to the law. That they did a lot of good. And they did what was reasonable. Remember we talked about uh, at around Christmas time that Women who committed adultery could be stoned. That was within the Jewish law. Well, it turns out that there is no recorded history of a woman being stoned for adultery in um, the Old or New Testament. And that is because people like the Pharisees had worked to say, if it says, do not kill, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to kill someone for committing adultery. 
So how do we deal with a situation like that? And so they worked out other means. So they weren't bad guys. They were people like us. The difference is they were trying to figure out the laws and get their lives into that framework. Whereas Christ for us has freed us from those particular laws and said, here is what you do. You love God, you love your neighbor, you love your enemy. Now try it out. <laughs> and we are living in a similar manner, the process of trying to understand how to live that way and to be that way. But we don't have a fear of the retribution if we fail at a particular <coughs> law because we have the grace of God. Amen? So how do, you be, how do you be pious? How do you know if something you're doing is pious or not? If it supports justice and righteousness, and if it is not in your own self-interest, you are acting in a pious way. Okay. If you're getting anything out of it, uh, not pious. <laughs> it's supposed to be done for the glory of God. That's the difference. Alms. Oh. I can just see it at the first congregation when I start talking about alms, about giving. Everybody sort of spaced just a little bit. <laughs> and I know it's not the culture of this area, and really of most churches, to talk much about giving money and things like that. So I'm just going to say this is what Jesus said about it. All right, y'all? <laughs> these are not my words. These are Jesus' words. First of all, the you suddenly switches from being plural to singular. So it's no longer you will all. It is you, 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 <laughs> Okay? This is an individual thing that Jesus then turns to talk about. And we get from the story of the widow's mite, the, the widow who gives the two last shekels she has, that Jesus prefers quality in giving over quantity. All right? So I'm just hitting the basics here. Uh, there's actually enough material in there to, act, to do a full sermon just on alms. And I probably will do it at some point because it does need to be discussed. Because money is talked about more in the Bible than in any other subject. Did you know that? Yeah, I saw a Bible once where every reference to money uh, and economics was cut out. It was a holy Bible. <laughs> it was hardly anything left. Why? Because that's the system we all work with. Right. So there was a man uh, who was a Jewish um, rabbi, an expert in the law, and his name, and I'll do my best, y'all, but um, it was Maimonides, Maimonides, you know? Maimonides. Maimonides. All right. <laughs> and he's got 40 years on me. <laughs> Anyway, my mommies, um, where were you at the first service? Um, he had established eight levels of giving, going from sort of the, the, the way, the least good way you can give. If you're going to be a jerk and still give, you give this way, which is uh, saying you don't want to, but putting it in the plate. <laughs> like, all right, but I don't like it, you know, here. All the way up to... Um, the form that Jesus highlights, which is that the benefactor, the person giving, does not know who they are giving to, and the person who receives does not know who, gave, who did the giving. That's the meaning of do not let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. There's a lot of other kind of screwy things that people have said about that phrase before, but, but that's what it means. Do not let those who are giving or as a giver, do not need to know. You don't need to know who it's going to. And the reason for that is because that anon anonymity protects the dignity of those who receive. Any other way in which you give, Mamamanes says, uh, creates imbalance in relationship. You are beholden in a way, or you can feel that way, or, you know. Jesus also says, if you give, don't expect, it. well, I'm paraphrasing here. If you give, don't expect your name to be on a building. 
Because then that's all the reward you get for whatever that gift was. So if you give a wing to a hospital, wonderful. Everybody in the hospital that has, if that wing has your name on it, they'll all know you gave that and they will bless you for it and you will get all that reward here. However, if you give a wing to a hospital and nobody knows you gave it, God's going to take care of it. The Mominis also, beyond those eight, had a saying that uh, might be familiar to a lot of you, and this is attributed to him. If you give a man a fish, I mean, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime, right? That's nowhere in the scriptures. It's not. Surprise! <laughs> it's not there because it is a Jewish teaching. At, a, at the, around the same time as Jesus was living, and it was not one that Jesus subscribed to. And in large part, Maimonides didn't even say it was the top one. He just said, hey, there's also this you can do, because he's a practical Jewish guy. But the reason it wasn't a part of that eight ways of giving is because in the Jewish faith, giving is central, giving to the poor. Taking care of the poor is a central tenet of their faith. You cannot be a good and righteous Jew if you do not help and care for the poor. So it's great to teach someone to fish. Let's do that. Let's help lift people out of poverty. But it's recognized that the poor will always be with us. There will always be circumstances in which people lose what they had and are, on that, are in that risk zone. And that's actually one of the reasons why we should give the way Jesus suggests. Because it goes on, her book goes on to say, two reasons to give anonymously. One, you never know when you yourself are gonna be the benefactor, or the recipient of help. On the way over here, I was listening to a woman who was talking about the fact that uh, she's in Kentucky and uh, the waters of a river just recently rose up over the roof of her house. It happened so quickly that they had to be rescued. She and her husband had to be rescued by boat. And um, she said, it breaks my heart because it's all gone. It's perfectly comfortable one day, gone the next. You never know when you're going to be on the receiving end. So practice humility in your giving and recognize that a whole lot of it has nothing to do with who you are or what you earn. And last but not least, recognize that everyone has something to give. You might not have two mites to put in the plate, but there are still things that you can do to give to the poor, to services, to the church. I had one man at my last a couple of churches ago, that he was a retired school custodian, and uh, he had to go on disability his last year. He just couldn't handle all the heavy-duty work that it, it takes to do that. And uh, they were on a very fixed income, he and his wife, and they moved in with their daughter and her family. And they began coming to our church. And he came to me one day, and uh, this church was very, uh, we were broke. <laughs> we were working to keep the lights on broke. And we hadn't had a custodian in a long time. And he came to me and said, Pastor, I don't have any money I can give, but I can clean those bathrooms for you. And I thought, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and he did. He was faithful about it. And I have never seen toilets that clean. He even would do the hallways on his good days when he could. It was such a blessing. There's always something that we can give because we are people of value, because God has made us with things within us, with gifts and skills and experience and trades. None of us are without worth and none of us don't have something to give. Last but not least, prayer. We've talked about prayer a few times in church, haven't we? <laughs> So I'm going to just hit the highlights, but they're important, and they're all right there. All conversation with God is prayer. We know this, yes? 
Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. All conversation with God is prayer. Um, Jesus says to focus on God and not on being the one who is praying. Okay? If you find yourself the subject of the prayer, oh dear God, I am so grateful that I am not like that lady over there. Y'all can't see my face. I'm making a face. Don't do that. <laughs> the object or the subject of the prayer, the, the one you are addressing should always be God. Even when we pray in here, when I pray and lead us in the Lord's Prayer, or when you're praying in your hearts, our audience is God. Amen? Even this, what we are doing right now, the worship portion, we, you are not the audience. God is the audience. We are together in an act of worship of God, talking about the Word of God, and worshiping and praising God. Do you see? So always allow God to be the subject of your prayer. Don't heap up empty phrases. Y'all, it's been making it hard to pray today. <laughs> that Lord's Prayer. I, I get a little paranoid in the back of my head. Are these empty phrases? If you're wordy like I am, uh, take a little comfort in knowing that God knows you are wordy. <laughs> and what Jesus is primarily talking about is don't stand up in the group and Make sure that everybody knows that you were praying and that you were a great orator and that you were great with words. Okay? You can get up and stutter and stumble through a prayer and God will love it just as much, if not more, than somebody who says a prayer insincerely. Okay? And um, also, if you need a little help and guidance in your prayer so you don't feel like you're just stumbling around, real quick, five-finger prayer, uh, five-finger way to remember Address God. Hey, God. Oh, merciful Father. Carpenter, you know, whatever. Address God. Praise God. Tell God what's on your heart. Ask for what it is that you're, you're hoping for or needing for yourself or others. And then thank God. Boom. That's actually the main uh, outline I use when I do my pastoral prayers. And then last but not least, thank y'all for hanging in there with me. <laughs> last but not least, you cannot bother God with your prayers. Nothing that you pray is a bother to God. God wants to hear everything that you want to say. And if you can't say it, God wants to feel with you everything you feel. And if you can only cry it, God wants to cry every tear and every sob with you. There is nothing too little or minuscule in your life and nothing so big or so overwhelming that God would not hear about it. Anything in your life that's on your heart, God wants to know them because God loves you. Jesus says, you know, even the Gentiles will, you know, be kind to one another. Do you really think that if you were to call God up and say, God, I need to talk about this. There's somebody who's just been on my nerves lately. <laughs> you think God's going to say, oh. If your child calls you or, or someone that you care about calls you and said, hey, there's something that, can I talk to you? Something's been on my, you know, bothering me lately. Are you going to hang up on them? If you do, come see me. <laughs> we need to talk. But you don't, because you care. And if you can care that much, how much more does your Heavenly Father care? But if you can care as your Father in Heaven cares, you will be more complete, more perfect, like your Father in Heaven. And it will bring the Kingdom of Heaven closer. Thanks be to God. Receive now this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God be with you throughout this week. Amen.